There's definitely times where I'll get comments or emails from people asking, hey, I can get this laser diode that says it's 120 watts for like 200 bucks. And like to get that with a CO2 machine that's multiple thousands of dollars. Why are CO2 so expensive? And that is because they're kind of lying to us. So in this video, I'm gonna go through five lies that these laser companies might be telling you and how to look out for them so you get the machine that's gonna work best for you. Okay, so first up, this is probably the biggest. It has to do with laser power. Now we're gonna cause a lot of times companies will list the power that is going into the laser versus the power that is actually coming out of the laser head. And this actually isn't as common as it was just a few years ago, but I definitely still see it, especially when I'm looking at sites like Amazon or Alibaba. And this is pretty specific to diode machines. A good rule of thumb is basically anything over 40 watts more than likely isn't true. Uh, 40 watts is the biggest I have ever seen. And they get that because they're combining eight laser diodes inside of this module and then shooting it all down to get like up to 80, you would have to have what, like 16? Like it'd get insane. Now I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. This is actually on Amazon. This is the longer Ray 5. I've actually tested out a machine like this and it does a good job. And a lot of times this may not even be a knock on the actual company, but just whoever's reselling it. So you can see they have it listed out as the longer Ray 5 laser engraver, 40 watt laser engraving machine. Now 40 watts you can get to. I have an Xtool D1 Pro that's 40 watts as well as an Atom Stack unit. But if you keep looking at it, uh, this is only 300 bucks and those other ones are well over a thousand. And if you keep looking through the description, you can see that it is five watt laser cutter and engraver. This one isn't as bad because it's still in the title, uh, but if you're just glancing, you're gonna see that 40 watts and think this is more than it really is. Now this example is one of the more extremes. This is from uh, Sculpt Fun. This is the Sculpt Fun S9, specifically listed on Alibaba. And I've actually reviewed this exact machine and it's good overall, but this listing is just all messed up. It just says 90 watt, CO2, CNC, laser effect engraving, cutting tool, high accuracy, 410 by 420. So they're just trying to stuff a ton of keywords into this title with the 90 watts being the big thing and 90 watts for $219. Uh, if that was true, uh, that would be amazing, but it's not. If you keep looking down here, what we're looking for is the laser output. And sometimes they're gonna bury that in the actual description. You can see the diode laser power. That's the actual power of this machine, 5.5 to six watts. Please note that light energy is not electric energy. So they're listing the electric energy, the 90 watts the machine is actually using versus what is coming out. And one thing I thought was just a straight up lie, I don't even know why they're saying this, is this big why choose the S9, the latest laser beam shaping technology comparable to a 90 watt CO2 laser effect. That's not true whatsoever. Uh, I've done tons of cutting tests between different machines and there is a huge change even going from a 40 watt laser diode jumping up to a 50 watt CO2 machine. You're gonna be able to cut a lot easier than what you can do with a diode. So be sure you're double checking that laser output, especially if you're getting a cheaper diode machine, make sure you're looking at the right number. All right, this is lie slash misconception number two that you're gonna see a lot on the listings. And this really isn't something that is listed on on the product description, it's something that usually is left off. And that has to do with safety, specifically with diode machines. Behind me, this is the Ohmtech Polar. This is a CO2 machine. So there is a glass tube back here. And you can see right there was what you don't really see listed on the diodes. The fact that this is fully enclosed. So while this is more powerful, it's also fully enclosed and it's got a lot of safety features built into it. Pretty much all of the laser diodes out of the box are going to be open gantries, meaning there's no enclosure. So all the nasty stuff that's gonna come up when you're doing cutting or engraving with those diodes are just gonna be out in the air. So I always try to recommend that people have it in an open air, well-ventilated area. And a lot of times these manufacturers will actually sell enclosures, but that isn't something that is usually built directly into the unit itself. They really kind of downplay how dangerous that can be because you can start a pretty serious fire and it can go really quick. So be super careful, especially when you're using those diodes. Also, they're gonna give you safety glasses and that helps kind of filter out some of the light. So that laser diode is going to be visible light and it's just gonna be nasty to look at, even if you are like nowhere close to the beam itself. It's just a whole nother reason that it would be great to have an enclosure. And they kind of like gloss over that when you look through the product description. So be super safe when you're with those laser diodes. 
it. All right, line number three. Ixnay on the wishing for more wishes. Has to do with autofocus. And unlike the cheaper laser diodes we've been talking about, this is something I see more with the more expensive CO2 machines. So like with lots of things, focus is super important. There's gonna be a certain distance between the end of the laser head and your material that your beam is going to be focused. And you're gonna have huge differences depending on how well you have that focused dialed in. So pretty much all of the laser diodes, this is something you're going to do manually. You're gonna move this up and down. And a lot of times they'll give you a spacer or sometimes they'll have something built into the laser head itself. It helps you know the right distance. For CO2 machines, they do it in a bunch of different ways. And true autofocus happens like one of kind of three different ways. Most reliable and the most popular is going to be a touch probe on the laser head itself. And either the head will move or the bed will move up and down to get it to focus. And once that probe hits and knows the distance, it sets it, it's good to go. So the Thunderbolt that I have, that is actually how it focuses. I've got a review coming of that very soon. But then I've also seen machines do it by actually having two different sensors on either side of the bed. And it basically raises the material up. Once it breaks that like invisible light beam, then it knows where the material is and it sets focus from there. The Thunder Nova 24 does that. Blowforge does it with like a secondary camera unit. But I also find companies will say autofocus, but what they really mean is that you can set the focus inside of the software and the Ohmtech Polar is a good example of that. This is actually a great unit, but they will list that this is autofocus and it's not autofocus in terms of you just hit a button, it focuses itself, it's good to go. What this does is the actual laser head itself can move up and down. So it's got a stepper motor that can drive it. And inside of the software, specifically Lightburn, that's what I like to use, you will actually set the material thickness. Uh, Lightburn does it weird because you actually have this like offset and that's basically the distance from like the top of your honeycomb bed to the laser head. So a lot of times I will use like three millimeter plywood and this has an offset of 17 millimeters minus three gives me 14 and that's the actual number I will put in light burn. And really the auto part of that has to do with the fact that it will move the head to the right position as long as you've like homed your machine to start. So it kind of knows the end point. It's not a massive, massive deal, but it can be kind of confusing. And I know people have definitely run into that issue in the past. So if we are like around the same age, so if you're in your thirties, really good chance you grew up on Pixar and specifically you grew up on Toy Story. I am Buzz Lightyear. I'm Buzz Lightyear. You can say my love for Woody and Buzz goes very deep as well as my love for all of the Pixar movies. And something being able to go deep brings us to lie number three, which is probably the most awkward transition I've done. It's just the fact that I had to record this on a different day, so I'm wearing a different shirt. But it's the fact that manufacturers really like to advertise that they can cut really, really deep into materials. And while what they're saying is definitely true, you can totally cut out things that are thick, like thicker acrylics or thicker woods. There's a pretty big trade-off with it in the fact that it just takes a really long time. I did kind of a silly test of just trying to cut out a two by four with a 40 watt laser from X tool. And the way I did it is I actually ran it slow at pretty high power because I was also trying to test how quickly you could start a fire. And running things slow at high power is a great way to do that. And just like with cars too, you can say that experiment crashed and burned. Uh -huh. But if you actually wanna be able to cut out thick things, you usually have to do high speeds at pretty high power for a lot of different cuts. And overall, the time just takes a while. There's actually a comment on that video where someone was just like, why don't you just use a chop saw? That's way easier. And if you're going to a laser looking to cut out really thick material, it may not be the best option for you. For diode machines, it can definitely handle a quarter of an inch, even up to half an inch. And as you step up in power for CO2 units, you can get thicker. But at a point, it just doesn't make as much sense. If you're just doing straight cuts, it might just make more sense to do a saw. If you're having to cut out shapes, it might be easier with a router or a jigsaw. Or if you still like the idea of having a robot do it and you have really thick material, then a CNC router is going to be a way better option than potentially a laser. But if your use case is engraving, lasers are great. And if you're cutting out relatively thin material, these are also great options. I'm wearing mater hoodie. And number five, the lie that a lot of these manufacturers are telling you is they're touting the top speed. And you'll see these great animations like showing comparisons between the two. And it's great because the faster you can run something, the faster you can finish something. So the more stuff that you can make, but it's not as easy as that. I feel the need 
the need for tweaks. So if I pull up the speed of a lot of laser diodes that I've reviewed in the past, this is actually a big like grid of all the machines I've done reviews of. Actually, if you guys want to check this out yourself, there's a link down below where you can get it. Also have a few promo codes to these manufacturers if you want it, and they will list out the speeds in millimeters per minute. A lot of times we've been in like the 10 to 15 millimeters per minute range, uh, but lately I've been seeing several manufacturers go faster than that. Uh, the X-Tool D1 Pro, they list out at 24,000 millimeters per minute. And then even some of the crazier machines, the Atzer, if I'm saying it right, L236W, and the IKEA K1 Pro Max 48 slash 24 watts, 54,000 millimeters per minute. And doing some quick math, that works out to 900 millimeters per second, uh, which is what a lot of the nicer CO2 machines can actually do. Now, there's a couple problems with this. The first is the fact that even though some of these machines claim they can run as fast as a CO2, like we talked about earlier, the power is never really gonna be over 40 watts. So being able to run it that fast is probably not that practical. And the bigger reason for that is what I think is the bigger limiting factor is the fact that they don't actually run that fast. More than likely, you're going to be limited by the acceleration and like how small of something you're trying to engrave back and forth. And here's an example of when I ran my machine from 10,000 all the way up to 24,000 millimeters per minute. So we've got this Creality 10 watt Falcon 2 running and you can see how much of the movement is slowing down and speeding up. So even though we have this set to 24,000 millimeters per minute, we probably aren't really running it at that high of a speed. It really isn't giving you a ton of time savings versus when we're running it a little bit slower all the way down to 10,000 millimeters per minute. And let me show you this now that it finished up. So you can see we definitely do have the speed increasing um, because it is getting less and less dark. But as I'm looking at this, pretty much anything over 18,000, uh, so these four going all the way up to 24,000, are all the same and maybe even a little bit at the 16,000 mark. So you're really not getting that increase in speed because we're getting the exact same result. So that's why even though they list super high speeds, a lot of times it's not practical. And you can also see that the edges get a little less clean as we go higher and higher, uh, just because the machine is moving. Um, so for me, I would probably run this in like the 14 to maybe 12,000 range at 80% power. Looks like a pretty good result for this guy. So those are the lies to look out for, but you might be wondering what are the machines to look for. I've done a full breakdown of lots of different machines that are out there and my recommendations for every budget. We're gonna jump into that right now. Until next time, go make or break something in your shop. See you guys.